Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's edition of Pathcast. Today, we are happy to welcome back Dr. Foster Rodriguez from Johns Hopkins Hospital, Baltimore. And he will continue his monthly neuropath lecture series. So he is into his seventh lecture in the series now. And today's topic will be tumors of the pineal region. And as always, feel free to share your comments and questions on the Facebook Live as well as a YouTube live chat window. And uh, Dr. Rodriguez will uh, answer the questions at the end of the session. And over to you, Dr. Rodriguez, please. Thank you. All right. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you all uh, today again. So we're going to uh, study a specific topic on surgical neuropathology that uh, at times can be very challenging. So this is what is recognized to be the tumors that occur in the pineal region proper that are pri pri primary to the pineal region. It must be must have in mind that uh, a lot of other tumors in the CNS can uh, involve the pineal uh, region by direct extension from adjacent structures like the thalamus, midbrain, etc. But these are the tumors that are felt to be arising in the pineal region proper. As you can see, the the number of tumors like the variety of tumors is not wide that you can have in the pineal region but the pineal region is very challenging first because it's rare, it's, tumors in the pineal region are relatively rare so uh, we don't see them every day and second is a very sensible structure the area around it you have a lot of veins coming out of there in, in that region so surgeries are very challenging and uh nerve-wracking for the neurosurgeon so the biopsies that you receive oftentimes are very tiny. Many times what you receive is a tiny biopsy that is done endoscopically that oftentimes is not um, sufficient for a, a specific diagnosis. And you are always concerned about tissue representation. So that's the main challenge that the biopsies can be very small and non-representative. So um, of course, correlation with imaging as another uh, surgical neuropathology areas is very important. Well, let's move directly to the cases. The, the first case is a 57-year-old man that had a history of pancreatic cancer and had an incidental finding at autopsy. So this is the section and actually you have two things here in the same slide. So hopefully you didn't get confused. This is the pineal gland here and this is the pituitary and the same gland. So they, you don't have, uh, just were uh, put together in the same slide. So don't have to worry about that. That's not a topic for today. Our topic is here and, and something that I recommend to you if you uh, do surgical uh, pathology and also autopsy is to occasionally put these structures, uh, even if they appear normal autopsy, uh, so you can get used to seeing it. The pineal gland, normally uh, can look like a tumor. It's, it's, it's lobulated and sometimes the architecture is, is a slightly variable in case to case. Uh, so it's something to get very used to. And as I mentioned, sometimes you have these biopsies that are very tiny and non-representative of the pineal gland itself uh, when you are worried about a tumor. And it's very tempting to look at something like this high, uh, at a high power and say, well, that looks really like a tumor. It's, yeah, it's a low-grade tumor or something. It's very easy to go down that path, which is essential to be um, cognizant of the normal histology of the pineal gland. And that's the, the main purpose of this slide here. The pineal gland parenchyma has this lobule. Sometimes you have even a suggestion of pseudorosets, uh, nicely lobulated, has these calcifications that are layered and sometimes referred as uh, brain sand that uh, increase with age. Uh, so the incidental finding here is actually in the center and you have a pineal cyst and a, a pineal cyst is something also that this is a small one that we found incidentally, of course. The main thing about the pineal cyst, you don't have a true lining, but what you have is actually a brisk pyeloidgliosis in the wall. And when you have these biopsies, uh, again, very tempting to try to make a diagnosis and say, well, yeah, it could be a pyelocytic astrocytoma or, or something, but you have uh, a variety of layers, actually. You have a layer here uh, in the cyst of the pyeloidgliosis and you have the, the pineal. In this particular small one, you have uh, pineal parenchyma. Sometimes when they're large, 
and they get biopsy, they come through surgical specimens rather than as incidental findings, you may have a cognitive tissue layer at, at one edge, but you do have a, a layering that is important to recognize on these. But uh, you see, it can be very cellular in areas like this, it's very tempting to call these a positive gastrocytoma. Normally, pineal cysts will be followed through scans, but when they are large or they have atypical imaging features, you will see them in as surgical specimens. So it's important to recognize them as non-neoplastic lesions that can be um, biopsied in, uh, in a, a, by neurosurgeons on occasion. So that's the main purpose of this case. So the diagnosis is pineal cyst. The second case is a 69-year-old woman that has no significant medical history. This came as a consult. Okay, so here you don't have a normal pineal. You have something that looks more like a neoplasm. There's some uh, congestion in blood, but of course the tumor is in between. And it's relatively cellular, and you have a, a proliferation of these small round cells with stipple chromatin. Relatively cellular, but you don't see much for mitotic activity. I mean, you may encounter an occasional mitosis or something, but this one, mitotic activity is not conspicuous. And you look around. You look around, so the main components are these small cells that are round, but then you start looking around in the cell and you also have cells that look larger, a bit larger. And actually some of them look like uh, ganglion cells. So the differential here so, uh, is, uh, has encompassed several entities. You can think about a ganglion cell tumor, like a ganglocytoma, ganglioma, that can occur in many parts of the CNS, including uh, uh, in this region. But seeing these areas here that are more neurocytic almost, um, in having a tumor that was centered really in the pineal gland proper, uh, the most likely diagnosis have some sort of pineal parenchymal tumor. And again, you move around, there's no much for, you do have areas that look more like your conventional pineal um, parenchymal tumor. Some neuropil. Not much for a glial component. You have scattered, probably reactive glial cells here and there, but not uh, nothing that makes you think of a, a, ganglion, a ganglioma, for example. There were several stains performed. And it was Synaptophysin is strongly positive throughout, which makes sense. You can see the neuropil and the neurocytic properties of the tumor very well. Uh, but something here that helped, uh, I think in this case, to me at least, was NUN, because NUN is usually uh, not positive in pineal parenchymal tumors, and you see that these cells that look more like a pineal parenchymal tumor in the middle are negative, uh, but you start seeing some of the larger cells picking it up.
so there is uh, more uh, advanced neuronal differentiation in this case, uh, actually ganglion cell differentiation. KI67, labeling index to confirm our impression that there's not much for mitotic activity. Your KI67 is also very low. We have a nice sample. Uh, it's relatively large. This is actually humongous for the type of samples that we get many times from the pineal region. So you feel comfortable that you're seeing a neoplasm and that you have a nice sample that is, we assume is representative, and also you have a very low proliferation uh, rate. So the diagnosis here was a pineocytoma, which is a, a, the lower grade end of the spectrum of pineal parenchymal tumors with ganglion cell differentiation. So this is uh, happens on occasion, and also you can have pleomorphism, degenerative type of atypia. Those are two findings that you will see on occasion in pinocytomas. If the proliferation is very low and you can convince yourself that this is really centered in the pineal gland and it's a pineal parenchymal tumor, uh, a WHO grade one uh, designation is appropriate. Let's move to the next case, case three. This is a 31-year-old woman that had a prior biopsy of the pineal region mass. I uh, showed you actually the second surgery. That was the slide that I placed on. So before we go to that, I, I want to show you the first surgery. which actually was a smaller biopsy. They look similar, but there are some uh, relevant distinctions. This is the first surgery. And you can argue in areas is cellular. Many of the pineal parenchyma tumors can be relatively cellular. But you are, you, and you start seeing these larger areas of what appear to be neuropeel, large and irregular. This is what you call pineocytomatous rosettes. They are uh, key feet, uh, morphologic structures that you see in pineal parenchymal tumors. They are a reflection of pineal parenchymal tumors. Often, most of the time, they're associated with a pineocytoma with lower grade tumors. Uh, and they also tell you that you are dealing with a neoplasm rather than pineal gland. You don't have these structures usually in the normal pineal gland. So it's something else that, uh, that it is very helpful uh, normally. This uh, biopsy had very little in the way of mitotic activity. Essentially, I had trouble finding even a single mitosis. Uh, so we had these pinocytomatous rosettes. You do have some pleomorphism, and that's OK. As I mentioned, you can see that in some uh, pineal parenchyma tumors, but the proliferation was very low. And in this case, uh, with the anemia stain that we do sometimes is uh, neurofilament protein. Uh, disregard the nuclear staining, which is a, just an artifact really uh, occasionally, but you see that there's a lot of processes in these pinocytomas those are said. So neurofilament protein has been used by, by some groups in, in degrading actually of pineal parenchymal tumors with the idea that the more differentiated they are, they tend to uh, preserve some relation to the pineal gland, which has a lot of neurofilament protein positive processes. That's a feature of well differentiated cells of this region, including well differentiated tumors. You also see them in these uh, rosettes. So the more processes that you have, the more differentiated the tumor is. Uh, it's, I <clears throat> find that a little bit difficult to include it in my grading, but I, occasionally we do the staining in, in the sentence to show that it's, it is at least has some, it's well differentiated. Uh, so this is neurofilament protein. And the tumor, of course, was also synaptophysin positive. Now let's go to the slide uh, that I actually uh, placed in advance for you to review, which is this case three. And if you look at it briefly, uh, you can see that uh, there's a lot of shared similarities. You do still have these pinocytomatous type of rosettes. 
you have a cellularity that is very comparable. Uh, if you look carefully, uh, then you start seeing what was uh, problematic in this case is that the mitotic activity was actually high on her currents and exceeded five mitosis per time high power fields. You can see one here in this field, a low power, maybe another one there, there, even there. So it is a tumor now that is very proliferative and that's something that you don't want in a pineal parenchyma tumor or in many other tumors of the CNS. So proliferation is one of the main features that we use for grading uh, pineal uh, tumors, CNS tumors in general, and pineal parenchymal tumors in specific. Pineocytomas should have almost no mitosis. Most of pineocytomas, you, you have trouble finding a single mite. Uh, you can tolerate the occasional one, but once you start seeing mitosis, something that looks differentiated, now you have to consider the next step, which is a pineal parenchymal tumor of intermediate differentiation. So this one, happen to be progressing. Most of the ones that I see are usually uh, pineal parenchyma tumors of intermediate differentiation at first diagnosis, but this one happened uh, to be uh, seen in recurrence. The first biopsy was small. Tissue representation is always something that you have to have in mind. It, it, we cannot tell for sure if that this was that tumor for the, from the beginning or if it just progressed over, over time on second surgery. But uh, from the history, it started growing uh, more uh, faster in more recent time, and that's what triggered the uh, second biopsy. So this one, even though histologically many areas you can say they're compatible with a, a pinocytoma, the, the extent of the proliferation is not tolerable for that diagnosis, at least in this second uh, biopsy. So the diagnosis here was actually pineal parenchyma tumor intermediate differentiation. I went with WHO grade three, and in if you read the WHO, you see that pineal parenchyma tumor of intermediate differentiation are part of the spectrum of pineal parenchyma tumors, and they can be grade two or grade three. The diagnostic criteria have evolved over time, and it, they, it, they're not that objective, to be honest. Um, so. And, you know, when I started practice, I used to actually leave a grade out, try to leave a grade out and get by with a long comment saying, you know, there's no good grading criteria for these, et cetera, and describe it. But my oncologists don't let me get away with that anymore. So I, I try to make a commitment to that. And I think it's a good practice. Where do you think it falls? More in the lower grade end or in the higher grade end? And I think this by proliferation and based on not only mitosis, but also in the K67, which I don't have here to show you, uh, was very worrisome to me. So uh, I added, I, I stretched myself and, and I added, it, it interpreted this as being a WHO grade three based on the proliferation, even though a lot of the architectural features are a little bit more uh, well differentiated. Next case is a 23-year-old woman with two months of increasing headaches that triggered uh, imaging. And we see something here, a remarkable mass in centered in the pineal region with heterogeneous enhancement. That is always very worrisome. This is a large mass. You can argue there are some uh, subsequent hydrocephalus uh, associated with it as well. So very worrisome, very tricky neurologically, a very sensible place to have a to have a tumor in in uh, because of all the manifestations that you can get. All right, and we see here again, a cellular tumor. You can argue there's some lobulation, but certainly this is a neoplasm, it's not normal, it's not normal pineal. And this one actually had a very remarkable mitotic rate. 
in areas. Uh, this uh, the proliferation was very high. You do have some suggestion of neuropil, but it, the cells are round and uniform. Here you have some crush artifact, as you get with some of these uh, small round cell tumors. A little bit of uh, neuropil, but certainly a uh, high proliferative rate, ha uh, much higher than actually the previous case that I showed you. Mites here, and almost in every field you can find a mite, at least in our initial cursory evaluation. Here, these are some areas of increased cellularity. Mites. More mites. Lesser extent of architectural differentiation in comparison with the previous cases that I showed you. Here's some stretching, some artifacts. Again, more mites. So, yeah, this is uh, this is concerning. This is certainly concerning. And the diagnosis here was pineoblastoma, the show grade four. Uh, as you see, this is a young adult, and many of these cases that I've been showing you are actually being adults. So pineal parenchymal tumors occur throughout life. So pineoblastoma is, yes, usually something that you associate with pediatrics, uh, with the pediatric population, but they occur throughout life. So it's, it's something to, important to have in mind that this diagnosis can happen uh, 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 really uh, at any age. This one has some areas that remind you of other, uh, in a little bit of neuropil that is a bit more differentiated, but the extent of proliferation in this case was just too high uh, to tolerate it for uh, just an intermediate pineal parenchymal tumor. As you can tell from these cases, there's, uh, it's a spectrum. The pineal parenchymal tumors are a spectrum from grade one to grade four, so it's not always very clear cut. If you have something with no proliferation, at the, uh, you can always put it at grade one and pineocytoma, that's easy. Uh, something at the other end that is very proliferative, in some cases you really look like a really uh, round blue cell tumor with a lot of necrosis is very easy. And then you have cases like this that really are very proliferative and have some extent, some some prolifer some uh, differentiation architecturally, but are uh, the, because of the proliferation, you 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 use those preeminently in assigning a grade. Moving next to case five, this is a 37 year old man that presented with headaches, nausea, and vomiting. Uh, this is not uncommon for a presentation of tumors of the pineal region. You have hydrocephalus that usually is a bit, develops a little bit faster with many of these masses. So given the critical location uh, near the aqueduct, so you have compression of the aqueduct and hydrocephalus and have all these uh, features of increased intracranial pressure, not uncommonly uh, uh, presenting signs and, and symptoms of pineal region tumors. And we have here a tumor that is developing an enhancing mass in the pineal region. And again, you have fragments. And again, this is another problem that you can have with these tumors. They are small uh, and with these samples from the pineal region, small, fragmented, cauterized. Again, there are a lot of vessels that are critical in that region. And, and uh, so the samples are 
uh, less than satisfactory, at least from the pathologic standpoint, and many times. But unfortunately, that's a situation. It's a very critical location for surgery. So you're seeing now something that has more of a pink stroma, coarse processes, something that looks in not so much as neuropil, but more as coarser glial processes. And this really looks like a glioma. And the reason I'm sharing you this, this case with you is that uh, you need to know that gliomas are very common in, everywhere in the CNS, and uh, you can get them in the pineal region in, in, in something that appears to even be centered in the pineal gland. You're starting to see some microvascular proliferation here. You can argue this is a little difficult to classify because the cells look like they have these coarser processes, brightly eosinophilic. Tough to assess here for infiltration. But the cellularity is worrisome. Cellularity is worrisome. Okay, so as any other tumor in that location, you can do your panel of immunostains in the pineal region. I do the similar panel of stains that I do for diffuse gliomas, but I also add synaptophysin and uh, maybe an, an additional uh, neuronal marker. Something, of course, that we are adding more and more in, in, in glial tumors is H3K27M mutant protein. And that is strongly positive in this case. And you see it's a good reaction because it's positive in neoplastic cells. It's negative in vessels and non-neoplastic cells. <clears throat> so actually, this is a diffuse midline glioma. H3K27 mutant. And remember that the pineal gland is a midline structure. So we are seeing more and more of these reports in isolated cases of diffuse midline uh, glioma H3K27 mutant occurring in the pineal gland region. So it's something to have in mind when you have a, every time I have a glioma in that location, I uh, certainly uh, stain it for these. Very clean reaction here, so it makes you think that it's absolutely real. So diffuse midline glioma, and as you know, this is by definition a WHO grade four. Uh, you really have to look. Uh, you know, there are some caveats now for these gliomas that have H3K27 mutations. Uh, so you need to make sure that you are dealing with a per C impact guidelines with that glioma that's diffuse. Uh, and this astrocytic, and of course, that has these mutations. So you want to make sure it's not, you know, dealing with a pilot that has so H3K27. You have seen those, we can see those on occasion or other relevant uh, related tumors. Uh, but this one was a diffuse glioma, and uh, unfortunately, it will be a, a grade four. Okay, let's move to. Case number six. This is a 17 year old uh, female with a, again, a gland uh, mass in the pineal region. That's how many times these uh, reach uh, my desk is uh, with this, uh, with very minimal uh, information. And this is what you have. It's a tumor that really catches your attention. It has a lot of papilla and pseudopapilla, a more epithelial type of appearance, you can argue. 
you have this very curious arrangement around vessels and uh, fibrovascular cores, probably. A lot of uh, breaking through the papilla, breaking around here. And again, compared to the other type of tumors that we're seeing, a bit more epithelioid type of appearance. Looks very similar throughout. Nested in areas. Nested in areas, but again, some of these ferrovascular cores, bland cells with small nucleoli. And there is one stain that is very helpful in these tumors, and that is a cytokeratin. Cytokeratin CAM 5.2, which is uniformly positive and strong in almost every cell in this tumor. Particularly when you have more of these papillary uh, formations. So this is cytokeratin CAM 5.2. So the diagnosis is papillary tumor of the pineal region. As you can tell, there's no firm WHO uh, grade for these. Uh, they are felt to correspond either to a grade two or grade three. There's no criteria for grading actually uh, at this point. Uh, some of these can behave in an aggressive fashion. There's nothing to have in mind. Some of them I've seen that have a, can have a lot of mitotic activity and even necrosis. So uh, this can behave, it can have histologic, uh, features of aggressiveness and clinical uh, features of aggressiveness as well. Uh, the differential diagnosis with these tumors are primarily a met, particularly if you see this in a older patient, you have to consider a metastasis from um, adenocarcinoma somewhere in the body, uh, given that these are epithelial tumors. Uh, and in the CNS proper, two things come to mind are ependymoma and choroid plexus papillomas. This is really centered in the pineal region, not in the ventricle. So choroid plexus papilloma is less of an issue. Just if you feel comfortable, you really are dealing with something centered in the pineal region. Uh, but ependymoma is also something in the differential. Ependymomas don't tend to have this ex the extent of keratin expression that you see with these tumors. Um, so, a, and you don't have well-formed pseudorosettes. So those are a couple of features that allow you to make that distinction. So pineal papillary tumor of the pineal region, distinctive neoplasm that occurs in this location uh, always. Next case is an 18 year old male presenting with severe headaches. Again, many of these symptoms are very similar in, in these patients. And this is what we saw, uh, you do have an MRI, an axial MRI post contrast that is actually showing a cystic structure centered in the pineal gland region, posterior for a, a third ventricle, uh, that is largely cystic. You have a little bit of enhancement in the periphery, and then you have a, a fo focal area here of enhancement as well. That's going to become very important in this how this case evolved. Uh, and then you have uh, T2 hyperintensity here in this location. Uh, this was actually a fascinating case and how it developed is that the patient had this is a second surgery actually the patient had a small biopsy and again this goes to tissue representation that show mostly this which is dry keratin and squamous epithelium. So this patient arrived with a diagnosis of epidermoid cyst and epidermoid cyst can occur in the pineal region. There are well-documented examples of that. It's a rare diagnosis at that location. Intracranially, they tend to occur mostly in the cerebellopontine angle, 
Occasionally, we see it in the cerebellum, other areas in the in the posterior falls, uh, occasionally in the pituitary gland, uh, but uh, they're relatively here in the pineal gland, but it's certainly, you can say histologically, this is the case. Now that this, the, the lesion continued to grow and to be symptomatic, so the patient went to another surgery, and this is what happened, what you have. So basically, it, I show you the, something in the imaging, and it was there was this area more of solid enhancement that actually caught the attention uh, of the treating team, and the patient went for second surgery, which showed uh, this additional component, which is a germ cell tumor, and then specifically a germinoma. Uh, so pineal gland and pituitary gland are the two locations where you tend to see most of these uh, germ cell tumors involving the central nervous system. So young patient with a mass in the pineal region, that's something that you always have to have in mind. They can be very, like in other places, we call it germinoma in the CNS, but it's analogous to seminoma in the testis and this germinoma in the ovary. Uh, they are exactly the same, have the same morphology. So it's just different terms for different locations. Chronic inflammation is typical, like in other locations. And this is also relevant in these uh, pineal region and pituitary, where you can get very tiny biopsies that are called inflammatory, uh, where the diagnostic cells are not present. So that is something else that you have to have in mind with small biopsy for these locations. Uh, any inflammatory process involving those locations can be actually a germinoma, particularly if you have a young patient. So this was uh, essentially, uh, you had a component of, and you can see here how intimately mixed they are. You have here a nice uh, squamous lining. And then you have here, for example, you can see this, if you biopsy this, you can call this basically an inflammatory process. Uh, and, and I have done that myself in, in the past, actually through learning. Uh, so um, it, it's something to have in mind. Something to have in mind that you can have uh, tissue representation in this location is uh, is key. You always have to have an open mind of other possibilities. Here, very nice uh, germinoma cells. So how we interpret this actual as a mi mixed germ cell tumor with uh, germinoma and mature teratoma components. These two components are actually associated with uh, are the components that are associated with a better prognosis in this in uh, in the CNS so even though you it's a mixed germ cell tumor um, you have two components that are relatively favorable uh, in that um, compared to other uh, components that you can see uh, in M germ cell tumors in general So let's move to case number eight. It's a 13 year old male that presented uh, with a lobulated pineal region mass uh, measuring 2.6 centimeters. And this was actually a very challenging case. You can argue it's lobulated. These are, of course, there are some bubble artifacts in this uh, slide. So disregard that. So it's a neoplasm that is low, it's relatively lower, um, low, relatively low cellularity. And again, the first thing that you think of some sort of pineal parenchymal tumor, you have some cell uniformity, you do have some stroma, it's a little bit coarser, more glial than um, neuronal. 
You also have these lobules, you know, this lobulation of low power is something to have in mind. You can argue you have some pseudo rosettes. And you can argue you start seeing some small lumina. Maybe some Lumina here. And Lumina for sure here. Not much for mitotic activity, not a very proliferative tumor. And uh, here the immunostains were very helpful. This is GFAP, which is positive. So we're dealing with something that's more on the glial side. You can argue there's some GFAP positivity around vessels this is s100 also positive this is neurofilament protein and it's negative and actually what it tells you shows you is a very nice circumscribed neoplasm that is pushing aside uh, the um, CNS parenchyma and it's really negative in the tumor cells and remember well differentiated pineal region tumors pineal parenchyma tumors which is a key differential diagnosis here are positive for neurofilament protein this is synaptophysin which is negative. Having a negative synaptophysin in a pineal region tumor essentially for practical purposes excludes uh, the consideration of a pineal parenchymal tumor. I don't think I've seen a pineal parenchymal tumor that is negative for uh, synaptophysin. It's, it's a feature of all, essentially all of them. It can be a little weaker, of course, in pineoblastomas, which are more poorly differentiated, but essentially synaptophysin is, is expressed uniformly by pineal parenchymal tumors. And this is EMA, which was actually very helpful. And it's showing this dot-like positivity between cells and many of these aggregates, which we were suspecting on the morphologic level to be uh, small lumina. So this confirms our impression, more or less dot-like positivity not only dot like but you are really seeing the outline of small lumina so this was actually an ependymoma and uh, it took a little while to get to this diagnosis because you usually don't uh, consider ependymoma when you're looking at tumors in the pineal region uh, the message of this case is basically that you can get a lot of cns tumors involving the, the pineal gland. So occasionally you do get ependymomas, uh, you can get meningiomas even, of the pineal gland proper. So it's always when something doesn't fit very well, doesn't fit very well, you need to start thinking about other primary tumors that you can get in the CNS and do the appropriate workup. Here the phenotype was extremely helpful and uh, we are a, now we were able to arrive uh, a definite actually diagnosis of a pneumoma. So it has a perfect phenotype for it.
Okay, let's move to the next case. 21 month old girl with a pineal region tumor. And we are seeing here fragments, very blood, a lot of blood again, fragment uh, biopsies from this location can be very bloody. And something that looks relatively epithelial, doesn't look very good. So kind of these epithelioid cells with prominent nucleolo nucleoli. Here you have a more almost core-like arrangement. You do have apoptotic bodies. Mitotic activity, brisk, necrosis. So we are dealing with a high grade tumor. And of course you have a differential here. You can have gliomas, a pineal parenchymal tumors. Uh, that was, those were all options that we considered. This looks more epithelial though than um, um, neurocytic or glial, but uh, those are all uh, good possibilities. Again, a lot of mitotic activity everywhere. You can argue there's a bit of an eccentric cytoplasm that is eosinophilic, but it's somewhat subtle in this case. And there is one stain that actually helped here. And that was I91. Smart CB1, I91. And this is a great field uh, because it shows you loss of expression, complete loss on the tumor cells with retention in non-neoplastic elements such as vessels and occasional uh, in cells in, in among the tumor. So the diagnosis in this case is a typical teratoid rhabdoid tumor. They can occur in the pineal gland as well. So it's something to have in mind that this neoplasm uh, occurs many times in the posterior fossa, in the supratentorial compartment. Uh, in very young children here, the age is useful because these tumors tend to be overrepresented in young children uh, under the age of two. Uh, and this, and it's important to have when you have something that looks high grade in the pediatric population, even at older ages, to always have this in mind. It's very easy to assess for this, uh, to exclude it or diagnose it using an INI1 stain. So in most laboratories are, you know, immunohistochemistry, you can uh, implement those. So it's a very useful stain, particularly if, if you are dealing with uh, tumors in the pediatric population. And this, the pineal gland proper is a recognized site where you can get it as well. Okay, now we're going to the last case. Six month old boy with a pineal region mass. Limited clinical information as well. <clears throat> All right. End to end, I wanted to show this case that is a remarkable um, mixture of histologic patterns. You have areas that look neuronal with almost uh, neurocytes, neuropil, cords of cells that are a bit more primitive with brisk mitotic activity, remarkable pigmented epithelium in these cords, some uh, collagenostroma. So very heterogeneous neoplasm, 
you can gather that it is high grade uh, based on the cellularity of, and areas that are more primitive. But this pigmentation, this combination of patterns is really something that very unique to this. Very unique. So there are a few things that can give you all these patterns. And I think there was another slide that I had that also had cartilage. So a variety of, of histologic uh, mor uh, morphologies. So the diagnosis is pineal and lash tumor is something that is known as such in this side. It's analogous to what it has been called primitive neuroectodermal tumor of infancy. Uh, you have some of these tumors also that occur in the head and neck that actually are in that location are in the mandible, for example, are associated with a less aggressive behavior. These are high grade tumors, by the way. So it's something to have in mind. They are so rare. We don't have grading criteria for them, but um, uh, the WHO um, usually discusses this in the context of pineoblastoma. Uh, some feel that there may be some sort of variant of pineoblastoma because you have a primitive neuronal component and just happen to have all these other heterologous elements. Um, but it's so distinctive histologically that probably it represents a, a, a different entity. It's just rare enough that um, there's very little data on, on, on what this actually uh, represents. So a very distinctive tumor occurs in this location, pineal lash tumor, high grade, uh, with the morphology that is indistinguishable. The main differential diagnosis, uh, essentially, I think it will be the only differential diagnosis will be um, a germ cell tumor, in which you can have many of these components, right, uh, in the pineal region. So, um, but this arrangement is really very distinct of areas that are neuronal with some neurocytic differentiation primitive components, pigmented epithelium, and um, uh, mesenchymal elements such as cartilage or even skeletal muscle differentiation in some instances. Okay, that uh, ends the case series. And, and now we'll, we can go to some questions if you have time to cover a few topics that we um, uh, discussed that are important. Um, so we have question one, what morphologic feature is distinctive of pineal parenchymal tumors, particularly pineocytoma? A is Flexner, Wintersteiner rosettes, Homer Wright rosettes, pineocytomatous rosettes, pseudo rosettes, and uh, two rosettes. I can see a couple of answers saying uh, D, that is, uh, someone says uh, pseudo rosette, that is D. That's one answer. And I also see pineocytomatous rosette as a possible answer. Uh, yeah, that is C. All right. And the answer is C. You can see other things in, in pineal parenchymal tumors, uh, but pineocytomatous rosettes are really a distinctive feature of the lower grade end of the, these tumors. As I showed you, pineal uh, pineocytoma particularly, or pineal parenchymal tumors of intermediate differentiation, they are really larger, irregular areas of neuropil. You can see Homer right rosettes in, in essentially all of these pineal parenchymal tumors, but you can also see it in other tumors. They are not specific. You see it in neuroblastic tumors. You see it in medulloblastomas. Uh, Flexner, Wintersteiner rosettes, you tend to see it actually at the, in, a, you can see it on occasion. It's more a reflection of retinoblastic differentiation, and it's something that you can see more particularly in a pineoblastoma. And retinoblastoma, as you remember, these two tumors can go together in the RB uh, syndrome. You can have a, or trilateral retinoblastoma syndrome, like it's called sometimes when you have bilateral retinoblastomas and, pine and pineoblastoma. So it's a, uh, you see it, tend to see it in more higher grade uh, tumors. Pseudorosettes, yes, you can see that in a variety of tumors, they are non specific, they are more conspicuous 
in ependymomas. They're more of a feature of ependymomas, but you see it also in pineal parenchyma tumors. And true rosettes, of course, you want to specify it a little bit more. I kept it vague for a reason, but true, you can have you can have true ependymal rosettes or multi-layered rosettes that go go with other tumor types. So, but pineocytomatous rosettes, they're they are really a distinctive and, and typical of, of, of pineocytomas. Question number two, which of the following immunohistochemical markers most useful in the diagnosis of papillary tumor of the pineal region? I see an answer for me. I think ZFAP, someone is saying. And uh, there is also uh, A. Someone says A, that is the CK Chem 5.2. All right, and that's actually the correct answer. Uh, you do have the differential here is with other you know, primary neuroepithelial tumors of the CNS. So uh, GFAP and S many of some of these can be positive. AMA is usually not as much, um, but you can have positivity for GFAP S100 synaptophysis invariable, sometimes weak. But what is distinctive is really the cytokeratin expression in these tumors. In particular, CAN 5.2 is very helpful. Um, uh, EMA, you see more with in ependymomas and, and, and other things, in aptophysing, of course, you see it more in the pineal parenchymal tumors. So this is a cocktail that you can use a, a group of stains for to, for to assess tumors of the pineal region. Uh, but camp, strong keratin expression is really something that you tend to be limited to epithelial tumors in particular in this region, papillary tumors of the pineal region. <laughs> Next question, an eight-year-old boy presented with nausea and vomiting, MRI demonstrated a pineal region mass that was resected, and molecular analysis demonstrated a DICER-1 mutation, uh, the most likely diagnosis is. Uh, we didn't go over much in our discussion over the mo molecular genetics, uh, but this is a good ex uh, chance to, to at least cover uh, one, one of these topics. I see a lot of A coming up, that is pineoblastoma. And that's the actual diagnosis. So dicer one mutations we know now, we start as many other tumors, the tumors of the pineal region, we're learning more about them. And we know now that pineoblastoma, at least some subgroups of pineoblastoma can have dicer one mutations and even be part of this pul uh, pulmonary blastoma syndrome that in which you can get um, uh, other tumors in, in the body so is um, one of these uh, genetic syndromes that have tumors in, in various organs. And pineoblastoma can be one of the manifestations, actually. And some of these patients that have these pineoblastomas can have actually germline dicer one mutation. So something it has implications for uh, other uh, for genetics, family counseling, etc. Uh, identifying a pineoblastoma with these mutations. Another subset of pineoblastomas have RB1 mutations, as I mentioned, and they are part of these, they can be part of this retinoblastoma uh, syndrome. So they are probably molecular subgroups of, of pineoblastoma that can be associated with a variety of other syndromes, which is uh, actually uh, 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 part of the new knowledge that we have about these tumors. I think this is the final question. A one-year-old boy presented with a pineal region mass in resection demonstrated a high-grade tumor with positivity for a variety of markers. 
including GFIP, neurofilament protein, and EMA, what additional markers should be tested for? I see E. A lot of people are talking about E. That is I and I one. Exactly. So that is uh, heard other markers there. You can use them in specific instances. But this combination of markers, I mean, it's, it's telling you that it's something that is very typical of rhabdoid tumors. They tend to express things that don't make sense together, like GFAP, neurofilament protein, SMA. EMA, when you have that combination, you have to start thinking about I and I1. And as I mentioned, young patient with a high-grade intracranial tumor, I will be more liberal in the use of I and I1 if, I, if you have it available and um, in trying to identify these um, um, ATRTs uh, since they can have a lot of more different morphologies. And it's a market that's relatively e easy to, uh, to uh, test for. All right, and I think that is uh, the end of the presentation. Uh, I hope you found it useful. Uh, feel free to uh, provide a, a, a if you wanna if you have additional questions. I'm happy to uh, to answer them, and you can also send us questions to the Facebook page, and we'll try to get them in, in a timely fashion. And uh, hopefully, you can uh, join us for next uh, month uh, session as well. The last Tuesday of uh, every month. Uh, for the next four months, I think we'll still have some four more presentations to go through to cover most topics of uh, surgical neuropathology. We have a couple of questions, Dr. Rodriguez. If you have time, I can pass them on to you. So there is one question uh, that's from Roberto. He wants to know, is dystrophic calcification typical of NCN pituitary glands? Of what? I'm sorry? Dystrophic calcification, is it typical of NCN pituitary gland? Of the pituitary, or are we talking about the pineal? I think the question is about pituitary. Pituitary. Uh, well, one thing is, is, is interesting uh, during development. Actually, the fetal you can have calcif you have calcifications in the development development during development in the in the pituitary region. So that's that's something that you can see now um, during development. Mature pituitary usually doesn't have much for calcifications. Uh, but you can get calcified tumors. You can also have re secondary reactions to cysts and things like that. So it's rare to have in the pituitary. It's usually pathologic when you see it in, in adults. Um, so it's, it's not normal to have it. In the pineal region, in contrast, it's normal. So you do have accumulate with time calcifications in the pineal gland. It can be completely calcified sometimes. Someone's making a, a, a calcium stone, really. So, and you can pick it up. It's something that's picked up very uh, all, all the time by imaging. So, calcifications are very typical uh, with time in the pineal region, but not so much in the pituitary. So, there is a very interesting comment. Uh, it's not a question exactly. Eileen says that uh, my large pineal cyst became a surgical specimen, and uh, who is from, she's watching from. North Carolina and says that uh, Dr. Sunil Patel removed the cyst on 5th June and she is uh, saying thanks for hosting the lecture on pineal tumors. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank I hope you. that she's doing well. Uh, there is another question about uh, pineal cyst. To Tam wants to know, what would you consider to be a large pineal cyst? Is it size that is more than one centimeter important or what? Yeah, I can't remember the size, and this is something, of course, is more of a uh, will be more a clinical consideration. What will trigger, for example, surgery or or not? Because we do see them on surgical specimens, so I'm sure that they have guidelines from the clinical side which wants to resect. Uh, the ones that I, I show you an incidental one uh, in an autopsy that probably will not trigger surgery. Uh, I, I will be very skeptical that I will go to surgery, but uh, the ones that we tend to see in, frozen, in 
in surgical specimen, they tend to be larger. You have very little in the way of residual pineal parenchyma. They tend to be essentially probably one centimeter or so. I mean, that sounds about right. But uh, I will check if you're really something you want to look more into the more the clinical literature. What will trigger uh, a surgery? Uh, the idea is that they are not that uncommon and they many of them are really followed through time. I think they get biopsy when they're large, they are symptomatic. Uh, and of course, you are not able to uh, to exclude some sort of pineal region tumor that you want to try to resect early. So there is another question. Uh, sorry, uh, it seems like Stephen Parsons seems like uh, having a problem. So he is from UK, 55 year old with a 22 millimeter symptomatic pineal cyst. And the question is, can I ask, I should expect this to present the same symptoms and surgical risks as a similarly sized benign solid mass? That's a great question. Uh, it can, if it's large enough, it can cause similar symptoms as other, uh, as, as pineal region tumors. So I think this, this, uh, you do, you can definitely get symptoms if it's large enough. And if particularly if it has grown fast enough. So many of these pineal region cysts are incidental, either autopsy, as I mentioned, or for imaging for other purposes. So they, many of them don't get resected. Uh, and pre probably because they kind of grow relatively slowly. As I show you some of these masses, like a pineoblastoma that I show you, those explode and grow very fast. So you, yes, the patient is going to get symptomatic um, as, as soon after development. So uh, so you can, it, it's bearable, but certainly if it's large enough, it can get, um, it, it can be problematic. And I think the other part of the question was, was um, I'm sorry, I missed that. Um, no, I can repeat it. Uh, I think yes. he's, a, he's a patient himself, and uh, he further adds, adds that uh, he has been referred to neurosurgery for candidacy, and uh, surgical procedure probably will be decided soon. They will be decided soon. Okay. So, and again, I, I think the, the, there are certain questions there. I think the two questions there is whether they can safely resect it with minimal, um, uh, with minimal problems. Uh, some of these uh, are done endoscopically, which is, you know, they probably are a little bit less, have less uh, amount of problems than doing an open surgery from, you know, in, in the posterior fossa. But I, again, this is something that really will be a surgical, uh, surgical problem. Uh, and of course, the one one is to relieve symptoms if the patient is really symptomatic. The other one is if they really have characteristics that do not allow them to separate these from a uh, excluded tumor, and and that's those are two scenarios in which I uh, obtain these see these, these specimens in surgical uh, surgically. So there's another question uh, about pineal cysts. Uh, Ashley wants to know that uh, what resources would you recommend for medical teams that believe that pineal cysts only cause hydrocephalus, only cause symptoms if there is hydrocephalus, and she further adds that. Are there researches or studies that demonstrate the other commonly experienced symptoms beyond hydrocephalus? Very interesting. So I I, I, sh I wish I had spent more time with uh, with with the pineal system. It looks like it has generated quite a bit of uh, of interest. So the pineal system. I'm sure that the situation now with advanced imaging is that uh, you know people get imaging for many different reasons and you know patients get you may have symptoms that are unrelated to that and it's very easy to say well you know i have a headache or i have some sort of visual problem and then you image and then you see something in the pineal region it's very easy to try to ascribe your symptoms to whatever abnormality you have there um it's it's very i, I don't think there's a, the cause and effect there is very difficult to establish of course if you have hydrocephalus uh, you can say, well, that is really pathologic, and you can, in in, in the situation is from the clinical side, um, is maybe the only real way to tell that yes, that that cyst morphology by imaging in an uh, anatomic basis to tell, yeah, this is really causing some effect because it's causing hydrocephalus. You can see it by the scan. You can say, yeah, the vent ventricles are enlarged. You can see papilledema sometimes in the in the eyes uh, in the eye exam as well. So when you see that, you say, yes, there is something problematic there, and you can definitely ascribe it to the uh, to the cyst. 
But other than that, if you have some subjective feelings, it, it may be related. Uh, you know, that certainly can be related. But many times they are just something that gets identified for imaging for in, in the origin of the symptoms. Maybe, um, maybe something. Um, maybe something else uh, my own feeling if it, i tell you, put in my my shoes in someone who may have a cyst will be um that i will discuss it with the surgical team uh, if i am having symptoms that are cannot be definitely attributed to hydrocephalus of some sort of anatomic mass effect uh, and i have a pineal cyst i will probably get a you know a second opinion i will probably get more than one opinion in uh, uh, regarding surgery uh, and be very skeptical having surgery unless it's really strongly advised. One last question. Uh, Bongami wants to know for fragmented lesions, how do you differentiate between normal versus uh, tumor in a pineal region? Absolutely. And that's, that is very challenging. And I tell you, it's not always possible, depending on the quality of the sample and the amount that you have. These small lobules in uh, low proliferation that is almost zero, is, there's other two features that, that I think help me the most to uh, separate, uh, to identify normal pineal parenchyma. Uh, if you have these calcifications also, occasionally you have it, not always, but you have these calcifications that are very laminated and enlarged. They're larger than and more irregular than some of my bodies that you see in meningiomas, these large irregular that you in aggregate uh, called brain sand that uh, certainly is more of a feature of a pineal uh, of the normal pineal gland uh, and you can also do stains you know the stains are less helpful really uh, they because some of the well differentiated pineal parenchymal tumors can have a lot of neurofilament protein and uh, and synaptophysin but that lobula lobularity uh, in in a very low proliferation that is near zero, there are, are two useful features uh, for it. Um, if the fra if if it's really fragmented and disrupted and crushed, which many times they are, uh, you can always be descriptive and say, you know, this is either you know, if it's a if it's a high grade tumor, you will be able to identify it regardless of the size, right? I mean, if it's well sample, I mean, if you start seeing mites, the normal pineal doesn't have mites at all, so. You, yeah, you can do, tell for sure that it's a tumor, but sometimes you can, if it, you if you really are stretching, you don't feel completely comfortable calling it tumor, it's better not to call it and, uh, and suggest that, yeah, you cannot exclude a pinocytoma or something very low grade, but uh, pineal parenchymal, pineal, normal pineal gland may be, may be the culprit there. Just to conclude, I think uh, Ashley is a patient here, so who says that uh, it's actually we answered to one of our questions about hydrocephalus. So she further adds that uh, my symptoms are numbness, tingling, and dizziness, and MRI shows a two centimeter cyst, and doctor says it's not causing any of the symptoms. And that's certainly, I would, I, to be honest, I would, uh... I will go with that information because again they have more information that I have and of course they they had, you know they, I'm sure that they if, if you feel comfortable if you trust your 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 physician that I will go with that uh, with that information if you really this, you can always get a second opinion if you you're not completely happy with a, one opinion uh, that goes for pathology and that goes for you know for for clinical assessments for for critical situations like this but uh, I if you know i will really be very cautious in, in going uh trying to go to surgery where something is not really felt to be causing any structural uh changes can it be the can it cause these symptoms i cannot say exclude that that it, it cannot be related or not but it's that you the symptoms that you describe can be have can happen for, for many many different reasons and many of them not due to set to structural uh, abnormalities that you identify that i will try to be very conservative and try to you know probably follow we closely with your team to make sure that this is not growing and not causing additional problems but uh if they're hesitant to ascribe it to your symptoms and hesitant to intervene i think that probably may be the most appropriate course Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez, uh, uh, and thank you once again for another 
wonderful lecture and the following discussions on pineal region tumors. And you would be very happy to know that uh, we had viewers from across the world, including Botswana, Australia, United Kingdom, India, Iraq, Algeria, Saudi Arabia, to name a few. And in fact, it was very heartening to see that we had a few patients who joined in and who had their uh, symptoms discussed. And Dr. Rodriguez was happy to answer many of the questions. And I hope uh, uh, the discussion and his uh, advice helped them as well. And uh, Dr. Rodriguez will be back again next month on September 24th. And he would be discussing on the tumors of the choroid plexus. Stay tuned for that lecture. And also the digital slides will be available prior to the lecture. So please feel free to uh, see the slides. And in fact, I would also like to remind that we have another podcast coming up today, 12 p.m. Eastern time. That would be on uh, cytology. The title is Fine Needle Aspiration Cytology of Salivary Gland Lesions a novel practical pattern-based approach to diagnosis. And the speaker is Dr. Matthew Jarka, who is a consultant in the Department of Pathology at Mayo Clinic, Arizona. So thank you everyone for joining in. And as always, please feel free to follow us on Facebook as well as YouTube. Thanks again. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez. Thank you very much.